good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from the outset, I'd like to thank Harvard University's Kennedy School in general and Professor Masoud in particular for the introduction as well as for facilitating and arranging this talk. It's provided me with an invaluable opportunity to visit Boston for the first time and to listen to the thoughts of all of you on this rather intriguing subject. So thank you for taking time out of your day and coming to listen to me speak on Egypt. I've prepared myself to speak for about half an hour, uh, despite there being no paucity of things that one could actually say on Egypt. Egypt has gone from being a place where no one would bother talking that much about politics, this was the case only three years ago, to being a place where people cannot stop talking about politics. I have something of a selfish motive in not speaking for too long today, and that is because I look forward very much to hearing your thoughts and your questions so that we can enter into a proper exchange rather than have me engage in talking too much. The title of my talk today is The Egyptian Transition, The Betrayed Revolution. And I admit it is a rather dramatic heading, but is one that feels particularly appropriate to me, particularly today. It was exactly three years ago, precisely today, that I woke up in Cairo, having traveled the night before from London. My plans had been very simple at the time. I was going to lay low for a while and use the time in a very peaceful, dull, boring city in the Middle East to write a book or conduct some research project. And obviously I would have no distractions whatsoever because nothing ever happened in Cairo. A few weeks later, the Egyptian transition began and I cannot remember a time in my life when I have known less peace, less boredom, and less dullness. And I challenge anybody to find another time. <laughs> There's been many a discussion and argument about those events three years ago, those 18 days that began on the 25th of January in 2011 and ended on the 11th of February. Some even talk about regrets of what happened then particularly as it set in motion a sequence of events that hardly turned out the way that anybody seemed to want or expect. As for me, I regard those 18 days as an uprising against Hosni Mubarak, the then president of Egypt, and an uprising that gave birth to a transition and a revolution. These three things I have to say are separate and distinct. The uprising ended on the 11th of February, 2011, the transition is ongoing and has not stopped since the 11th of February, and the revolution continues to be betrayed. I say betrayed with a very clear meaning, and it's perhaps one that betrays my own subjectivity, uh, which I tend to make very few apologies for. It's a subjectivity that's born out of having been in that square three years ago, during the 18 days of 2011, and seeing what was there. It was not, as some now try to retroactively imagine or say, some sort of imagined utopia. It was real. At its core, in my opinion, was the ability of people to engage with their differences, with respect, with dignity, without needing the heavy-handed authority of state machinery to ensure civility. I remember one of those days I was in that square, I saw a group of Azhari Imams supplicating to God for the success of those in the square. Not to de destroy something, which is what we tend to associate with such activities, but to build something. Perhaps 10 meters away, yeah, I'd say about the distance between that door and that wall, I saw Nawal Saadawi, a very famous Egyptian feminist, discussing with Islamists her ideas. Um, probably another 30 meters that way, I found groups of Nasserites and socialists, Christians and Muslims, men and women, young and old. That was the intriguing space that the space of Tahrir actually was. And I remember thinking at the time, this is the Egypt the young Egyptians are actually taught about, that they're taught exists, but they've never actually seen it. There was a famous religious scholar called Ahmed Affet, who was later killed by state forces later on that year after the ouster of Hosni Mubarak. Uh, he entered that square and uh, there was a very famous line that lives on even after his death. He said, the first time I went to Tahrir Square, 
was the first time I saw Egypt. And people can call Sheikh Ahmed many things, but I doubt many would call him an emotional, utopian idealist. Much has happened since those 18 days, three years ago. The people of Egypt placed their faith into a military establishment to take them through a transition to a political frame where the ideals of the Tahrir Square Revolution could be realized, and they were quickly disappointed. Much has been said of Field Marshal Tantawi's tenure of the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces and the facto president of Egypt from 2011 to 2012, but no one can say he formulated a roadmap that served to stabilize Egypt on a path to a more pluralistic, democratic state that protected fundamental rights. Tantawi ousted Mubarak because Mubarak became a liability, not because of some sort of revolutionary zeal, as we all now know. The betrayal, it seems, <coughs> that we talk about in, today, in today's talk is it began on that first day, on the 11th of February, in formulating that very roadmap. The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces ensured the transitional process that was doomed from day one to bring Egypt to any place that was better than what it had started with. And this was most assuredly not what the activists in the square that had brought Tahrir Square into existence had ever argued for. But that would have been revolutionary, and if the Egyptian military believed that there was a revolution, it was a revolution that ended as soon as Hosni Mubarak was removed. Accountability of those in power, economic reform, reform of the security sector, in fact any reforms at all, none of that was really ever on the table. Having said that, the process did deliver Egypt to elections, presidential elections and parliamentary elections which brought an impressive showing for Egyptian Islamists, no more so than the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood received around half of parliamentary seats and a member of theirs to the presidency. Surely this in itself was a revolutionary success? Well, it could have been. When the roadmap was announced in 2011 for a referendum on that roadmap, most of the revolutionary forces opted for a no vote. The Brotherhood, on the other hand, aggressively pushed for a yes vote. And Islamists of other shades, and also, it must be said, some of those who supported the Muslim Brotherhood, pushed for a yes vote on the basis that a no vote would be a vote against Islam. It was a divorce between the Brotherhood leadership of the time and the revolutionary trend in Egypt that never... I don't think the revolution ever recovered from that. From that point on, the Brotherhood's position was clear. The revolution succeeded on the 11th of February in ousting Hosni Mubarak, and now the priority was to enter into a regular democratic political process with elections, over and above all else, including calls for accountability even during the transitional process. Maspiru, Mohammed Mahmoud, these are names that we know as scenes of killings during that transitional process that nobody has been held to account for and merely were counted as part of the, the process that Egypt had to go through. They were regarded as secondary to the need to get to elections. Instead of standing by those protesters who were killed in the streets for very lofty ideals, the Brotherhood stood by the military and actively participated in characterizing those protesters as troublemakers and instigators of chaos. By the time Morsi faced off against Mubarak's last Prime Minister, Ahmed Shafi, in 2012 for the presidential election, the Muslim Brotherhood was already being described as Ikhwan Kazibun, in the same way that the military had been described as Askar Kazibun, Brotherhood liars and military liars. Morsi won, a victory he could not have won without the support of revolutionary supporters who insisted that a Shafiq victory would simply mean the return of the security state and the defeat of the revolution entirely. Many who had opposed Mubarak were reticent, but they preferred to take that risk. In return, Morsi made a series of promises to uphold the revolution and to build a genuinely inclusive government that would take the transitional process further along to democracy. 
It didn't quite work out like that. Very soon, that coalition that had supported Morsi's candidacy against Shafi were alienated by his government, which focused on a very deep partisanship. In a normal democratic system, that's very normal. It's exceedingly normal, as anybody in the United States who looks at American politics will realize. In a transitional process, where the institutions of power are not yet normalized to democracy, that was not only unwise, it was a turning back on promises that Morsi himself had made, a turning back that was sealed when he issued the decree granting him extrajudicial authority, i.e. placing him above the law, and forcing through a constitution that deeply polarized the country. That's a year ago. I know it's a year ago because I was in Egypt. I also know it was a year ago because I received press releases from the Muslim Brotherhood on today as a remembrance of the glorious <coughs> constitution that was passed a year ago. It seems some people don't learn. His movement was hardly more revolutionary than he was. The leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood called for supporters of their movement to descend upon protesters maintaining a peaceful vigil at the presidential palace under the pretext of defending the president. An act of vigilantism from the party of power, which only served to further destroy any trust between non-Islamists and Islamists. Morsi was in power for a year. I remember during that year, as I was in Cairo, I'm living there, that I felt that there were essentially two powerful forces battling against each other. There was the Muslim Brotherhood and its allies, on the one hand, which had titular control over some parts of the state and real control other, over other parts of the state. And then there were the former Mubarak networks, what we describe as the deep state, as problematic as that phrase may be, who were diehard enemies of the Muslim Brotherhood as well as, of course, the revolution. In the midst of clashes between the two, there were some efforts by the Muslim Brotherhood to co-opt or come to arrangements with some parts of the former Mubarak network in order to neutralize it. But what was clear was that the state itself could not be deemed to be under any one hand or any one party's control. It was a disputed state. It was a disputed space of power. And in a very warped fashion, that actually had positive benefits for the activists in Egypt. It meant that some public space was open as these two juggernauts fought against each other and focused, obviously, their energies on each other. But where Mubarak networks had everything to gain during that year, the Brotherhood had everything to lose. The high point of the Muslim Brotherhood's popularity was in March 2012. Then around 60% of Egyptians expressed confidence in the Muslim Brotherhood based on figures that uh, I myself analyzed when I, used, uh, when I used to work at Gallup. That was the best it ever had, March 2012. Since that point, it decreased, leading to a slim victory over Shafi later that year and a confidence rating of around 17, 17% in May of this year. Disappointment in Morsi in particular was around three quarters of the population and the call for early presidential elections that had begun with the likes of the liberal politician Amr Hamzawi and the reformist former Muslim Brotherhood leader Abu al-Futuh, that call became more and more popular. Based on surveys collected in May, around 6 out of 10 Egyptians wanted those early presidential elections and that number probably increased by the time the 30th of June protests began with the vigorous and unrelenting media campaign that then took off. Morsi could not do the job without building and sustaining a pro-reform revolutionary coalition. And his betrayal of that promise would prove to be his undoing as it exposed him to more enemies than he thought possible. We now come to June 30th itself. And I want to be very clear on this point because I think many people misunderstand it. I think it's entirely democratic and entirely legitimate to call for early presidential elections in any presidential system. When this call takes place in a country where the president himself has broken the law, it's entirely justifiable to call for such early presidential elections. When this call 
takes place in a country where the president would not have even been in office except for a revolutionary uprising, which he swore to fulfill or resign if people took to the streets, then I would say it's bizarre not to call for early presidential elections. Here's the rub, though. What do you do when he doesn't listen? And this is this, this a discussion that people are now having four months after the fact, after there was a coup. Now people are having this sort of discussion. What do you do when he doesn't listen? On the 28th of June, I was due to fly out of Egypt for my first real holiday in three years. Mm. Three years. My first holiday. And after listening to Morsi's speech on the 26th of June, which was two hours, 45 minutes, and an odd number of seconds, it became clear that things might get a little bit difficult. So I opted to stay. <laughs> I want to be very clear here. I did not stay in Egypt for the 30th of June protests because I believed in those protests. Actually, I didn't believe in those protests. I was actually very afraid of those protests. My impression at the time was that there was no way that Mohammed Morsi would ever leave office, regardless of whether 80,000 or 80 million came out of the streets. Mm. And incidentally, there, there were television reports of apparently 70 million Egyptians coming to the streets. Yeah. These are very interesting reports. O over multiple days. No, actually one of them was on a single day. But, um, the, the war of numbers in Egypt is, is an ongoing struggle, as you may imagine. Um, but I didn't think that regardless of how many people did come out to the streets, and incidentally I don't believe the numbers that have been widely reported, um, I didn't think that that would matter. Everything that we had seen of Mohammed Morsi over the past year, and actually going far back before he became prominent, showed one thing. He was a stubborn man who might listen to the Muslim Brotherhood leadership, but not to millions of people in the streets, if he even believed that they were there. My thoughts about the 30th of June were as follows. If Morsi left, it would be because he was forced to leave by a military that regarded him as a liability in the same way that they regarded Hosni Mubarak as a liability. The military had regarded Mubarak as a liability only after widespread violence and the incapacity of Mubarak to maintain order in Egypt. And all of that had resulted in a thousand people dead in the streets. And I feared that that would be the same impetus on June 30th. And for that reason I had no interest in staying and being a part of that sort of event. I stayed because I thought that there would be violence and I wanted to ensure that nobody would be defending my neighborhood while I was off vacationing in Spain. I don't know if I made the right choice. Anyway, um, the military did not wait that long. They issued their ultimatum on the first day after the biggest protest began, and Morsi was removed several days later. Let us be clear. Again, there were many who called for the June 30th protests, who had been extremely explicit and very clear about their rejection of any role for the military in any political process, and had insisted that Morsi would have to leave as a result of his either calling for early presidential elections or his resignation. When the military did eventually intervene and remove Morsi and install their own government, after he rejected either of those options, the die was cast. There will be some who say it was necessary. And I understand the argument because I also suspected that there would be violence and paramount to my mind and I would hope to the mind of anybody who cared about Egypt the most paramount thing would have been to prevent loss of life rather than even the democratic process. But the argument is still, at least for me, incredibly incomplete because there were other choices. There are moot choices now, there are academic ones for us to discuss and theorize about, and they weren't going to ever be uh, without their own mess to deal with. But what has come to pass now has been by far, in my opinion, the messiest betrayal of the 2011 revolution. It's my considered opinion that in the choice between maintaining 
the democratic processes that would have kept a highly unpopular president in power over a military that was and is popular among the overwhelming majority of the population, the Egyptian population chose the latter. I think that's tragic for the democratic process in Egypt. But there are, after all, different levels of tragedy. Some tragedies, after all, can be less damaging than others. In one regard, Mubarak's ouster was a tragedy in that it handed over political life in Egypt to a military as opposed to some sort of civilian council, for example. But it at least got rid of Mubarak and not hundreds upon hundreds of people die. Blood is the cost of this latest tragedy and this latest betrayal. The military-backed interim government has not been a disappointment because one would have had to have had high hopes for it in the first place for there to be disappointment. July 3rd meant that any process had to be met with great skepticism if some cautious optimism, but the following days and weeks destroyed even that. And I mean literally within two weeks. Neither the pro-Morsi camp nor the military-backed government can claim to be the good guys in terms of blood. Pro-Morsi militants have killed and attacked dozens of Egyptian police officers and soldiers, while the same sectarian rhetoric that so reviled Egyptians under Mohammed Morsi's rule continues to be a marking feature of the pro-Morsi campaign, and Coptic Egyptians frequently pay the price. Strategically, the Muslim Brotherhood failed to take even the strategic small wins it had been offered, such as inclusion in the post-Morsi cabinet, which might have somewhat weakened the power of the Ministry of Interior along with the security apparatus. But ladies and gentlemen, the Morsi government is not in power. The Muslim Brotherhood are not in power. It is not the state. It was the state that decided against far more level heads, even within its own cabinet, to forcefully disperse the sit-ins calling for the return of Mohammed Morsi. When it was abundantly clear and very evident that it would lead to severe loss of life. On the 14th of August alone, more civilians perished as a result of state action than during the entire 18 days of the 25th of January uprising. I'm not sure we can call that a betrayal (coughs) because if the Muslim Brotherhood camp stands accused of having supported the revolution only for its own partisan interests, betraying it for the same, I'm unconvinced that those who are responsible for the clearing of Rabah ever supported the revolution in the first place. We now enter into a rather awkward phase in Idris' transition, and it is still a transition. It is a phase, ladies and gentlemen, where around 1,500 to 2,000 people have died in total since the 3rd of July. And thus far, accountability for their losses is not particularly likely. It is a phase where a new constitution will be voted on, but not because of its contents. Rather, just like last time, it will be voted on to send a political message to a particular faction, rather than being a document that brings Egyptians together. It is a phase where ultra-support for the Egyptian military means that the media now characterizes those activists that opposed Morsi as somehow being pro-Muslim Brotherhood, because they now oppose the military-backed interim government. It is a phase where human rights organizations and civil rights organizations who were certainly opposed to Mohammed Morsi's government, are expressing more reservations and fears than ever that the state of Egypt is showing signs of a return to an even more deep (coughs) security state than it was under Hosni Mubarak. It is not an easy one, this phase. It's a pretty tough phase, to be fair. But... It is also a phase that I find, after quite a bit of consideration over the past three years, to be completely unsustainable. The conditions that led to people going out on the streets in 2011 remain. 
the economic conditions exist. Actually, they've gotten worse. Security sector reform is still a figment of very few people's imagination. And corruption remains widespread throughout the state. The question is not if change will continue to be the marker of Egypt's transition. The question is only how much change there will be. And what the, will the price paid be until the powers that be realize that a sustainable future for Egypt must address these core concerns and issues in a realistic and conducive manner. The revolution of Tahrir may be betrayed again and again, but its reasons for coming into existence in the first place are the results of inevitability, and it is inevitable that as long as it continues to be denied, instability will ensue. The sooner those concerns are addressed holistically, the sooner a stable edifice for a new Egyptian republic can be built. Until then, the foundations of this republic, it seems, will continue to be rocked to its core. Because, ladies and gentlemen, betrayal does carry its own price, even in the realm of politics. And with that, I thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much.